All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the EPA WaterSense Program's What's Cooking? Commercial Kitchen Savings webinar. This webinar is being put on as part of the Hotel Challenge training series. I'm Laura Wetzel, a supporting contractor to EPA's WaterSense Program, and I will be moderating today's presentation. Before we get started, I'd like to introduce you to the three presenters you'll be hearing from today. Hosting this webinar is Tara O'Hare with EPA's WaterSense program. Tara currently serves as the Implementation and Commercial Outreach Lead for WaterSense. She's responsible for program operations, partner support, and outreach to commercial and institutional facilities. Tara is currently managing the Hotel Challenge, and she was responsible for the release of Water Sense at Work, Best Management Practices for Commercial and Institutional Facilities, which you'll be hearing more about during this presentation. Our second speaker will be Kim Wagner with ERG, a licensed professional engineer and also supporting contractor to WaterSense. Kim assists EPA in developing product specifications for the WaterSense program, and she provides technical support for WaterSense's efforts in commercial and institutional sectors. She also conducts water assessments for federal facilities to identify and assess water savings opportunities for those buildings. Finally, we'll wrap up the presentation with an informative case study on commercial kitchen water savings measures that were implemented at several dining halls at Loyola Marymount University, presented by Ray Dennis. Ray currently serves as Associate Vice President of Auxiliary Management and Business Services for Loyola Marymount University. He has an MBA from Pepperdine University, Masters of Arts in Theology from Loyola Marymount University, and is a Certified Auxiliary Service Professional by the National Association of College Auxiliary Services. He now oversees the dining, textbooks, printing, mail services, and campus card office services. And these business services must demonstrate leadership and sustainable practices and environmental stewardship to reflect the university's mission and demonstrate social responsibility to its faculty, staff, and students. Let's quickly review a few housekeeping items before we begin. All attendees have been muted just to minimize background noise, but of course we do want to answer your question. So if you do have a question during the presentation, please type it into the chat box on the upper right hand side of your screen. We'll have a dedicated time for Q&A at appropriate breaks throughout the presentation. Lastly, we are recording this webinar for future viewing. You'll receive an email once we post it to the WaterSense website, and when you do, please feel free to share it, the recording with any colleagues or business contacts that you think may benefit from it. Now I'd like to invite Tara O'Hare to review the agenda for today and start us off with an introduction to WaterSense and the Hotel Challenge. Tara? Thank you for those introductions, Laura, and welcome to all of you joining us today. As Laura mentioned, I'll start by providing a brief overview of the WaterSense program, the intent of the Hotel Challenge, and some rationale for why you may want to save water at your hotel. Then I'll ask Kim Wagner to discuss some of the key strategies and water efficiency best management practices for reducing water use in any commercial kitchen you may have as part of your hotel. Finally, Ray Dennis will present a case study about Loyola Marymount's water efficiency efforts and success in reducing commercial kitchen water use at a major dining hall on campus. At the end of the webinar, I'll review what we learned, talk about our upcoming trainings, and give you some quick tips to get started on reducing commercial kitchen water use in your hotel. For those of you new to these calls and may not be familiar with WaterSense, let me give you a brief summary. WaterSense is a voluntary program started by EPA in 2006. We work with a variety of partners to promote water efficiency and encourage innovation in manufacturing. Our goal is to help organizations and consumers save water for future generations. The WaterSense label, which is displayed here on the slide, provides a simple way for consumers to identify water-efficient products, homes, and programs. More than 11,000 different models of plumbing fixtures and irrigation products have, been, have earned the WaterSense label to date. Products receiving the label have been independently certified for water efficiency and performance. 
In addition to labeling products, homes, and professional certifying programs, we try to approach water efficiency from many angles. We've developed best management practices to help commercial and institutional facilities design, operate, and maintain their buildings and landscapes as efficiently as possible. WaterSense at Work, our best management practices guide for commercial facilities, is the focus of this training series. WaterSense also works with partners to educate consumers and users so they can reduce water use through their actions and behaviors. This connection to behavior change is vital to the success of the WaterSense program since many reductions can be achieved during the use phase of a product or system. This slide shows all of the residential and commercial products eligible for a WaterSense label. The label is generally reserved for products that use at least 20% less water and perform as well or better than standard models. Since the program was launched in 2006, WaterSense label products have helped consumers save more than 757 billion gallons of water and $14.2 billion in water and energy costs. We also work closely with Energy Star to include water factors in their specifications and to include energy savings in hours. As I mentioned earlier, to help commercial and institutional facilities understand, manage, and reduce their water use, we developed WaterSense at Work. This guidebook includes best management practices in many different areas, including water management planning, water use monitoring and education, sanitary fixtures and equipment, commercial kitchen equipment, outdoor water use, mechanical systems, laboratory and medical equipment, and on-site alternative sources of water. Product and equipment specific chapters in each of those main water areas cover water efficient operation and maintenance, retrofit, and replacement recommendations. Water Sensor Work also includes ideas for enhancing education and outreach in these commercial and institutional facilities to promote water savings. As most of you know, WaterSense launched the Hotel Challenge earlier this year to encourage and assist hotels in saving water. We currently have 767 hotels from all over the country that have taken the pledge. As part of the challenge, WaterSense is providing participants with the tools to act, which we talk about as assessing water use and savings opportunities, changing products and processes to incorporate best management practices, and tracking water savings. Once your hotel takes the pledge on the WaterSense website, you'll receive emails that include several items to promote your participation, including a participant logo, a signed certificate of participation, and sample language to use in your in-room binders, websites, and guest service television. Every hotel that takes the pledge will also receive monthly water saving tips and reminders about WaterSense webinars. The training webinar series, which includes this one today, reviews water conservation practices that are applicable to hotels and each training will feature a case study showcasing how specific measures can be successfully implemented. WaterSense recently released our Water Use and Savings Evaluation Tool, the Water Use Tool, as we call it, which can be used to help hotel managers and facilities personnel identify, evaluate, and prioritize their water saving projects. The Water Use Tool and its associated water assessment worksheets and other technical tools are available on our website. Those of you who are on this call probably don't need convincing to save water, but let's quickly review a few of the main benefits. First and foremost, saving water can help reduce operating costs. Water and sewer costs are rising well above inflation with no signs of slowing down. In addition, saving water can save the energy used to heat water, and saving water and energy can help improve equipment efficiency, which often reduces maintenance costs and man hours required for repair. While reducing your bottom line, saving water can also increase your competitive advantage. A recent survey by TripAdvisor found that 79% of travelers place importance on choosing eco-friendly accommodations. You can also demonstrate your leadership in your community, for example, by participating in programs such as this hotel challenge. It's important to look at water and energy use and savings together uh, when evaluating projects, since moving, treating, and heating water uses energy. For some products or systems, saving energy also results in saved water. For example, reducing the cooling load of your mechanical equipment to make it more energy efficient will reduce the amount of makeup water you need to add to your cooling tower. When evaluating potential water or energy efficiency projects, you should evaluate the project's water and energy reduction potential since the combined cost savings can improve your return on investment and will make the project savings estimates more accurate. 
Also, water and energy utilities both often offer rebates and incentives for efficient technologies, so be sure to look into what your utility provides before you get started with any water or energy efficiency project. In addition to the tools that WaterSense has created, Energy Star also has developed several useful tools and resources to help commercial kitchen operators better manage their water use and identify ways to save energy, water, and money. They label several types of water using commercial kitchen equipment, which we'll discuss in more detail later in the presentation. And in many cases, they include a water factor or provide information on equipment water use to help inform purchasing decisions. They have also developed a commercial kitchen equipment savings calculator, which can be a useful tool for estimating water and energy savings and operating costs of various types of commercial kitchen equipment. WaterSense has integrated the water using equipment models from the Energy Star commercial kitchen equipment savings into the water use tool, which also is a good resource for evaluating potential projects across all of the hotel's operations, including commercial kitchens. So I encourage you all to take a look at their website that's listed here on the bottom of the slide if you want more information about Energy Star's resources. Thanks a lot for that overview, Tara. So remember that all attendees are muted to reduce background noise during the presentation. So if you have any questions, please type them into the chat box at the right of your screen and we'll address them as they're received. It looks like we don't have any questions at this time, so now I'd like to ask Kim Wagner to talk about water saving products and practices used in kitchens. Kim? Okay. So before we dive into the specific types of equipment and operations that use water in a commercial kitchen, we wanted to start off by giving you a frame of reference for how water is typically used within a hotel. As you can see on this graph, approximately 30% of a hotel's water use comes from guest room sanitary use. The next largest uses of water include laundry, landscape, and commercial kitchens. So believe it or not, health hotels almost use the same amount of water in the kitchen as they do in laundry and maintaining the outdoor landscape. So it's certainly a water use area that's worth some attention. There are three main types of water uses or water using equipment in the commercial kitchen. There's food preservation, which includes ice machines, food preparation, which would include equipment such as combination ovens, steam cookers, steam kettles, and wok stoves, and then cleaning and washing equipment, which is probably what you're most likely to think of when you think of commercial kitchen water use. And this would include equipment such as pre-rinse spray valves, dishwashers, food disposals, and washdown sprayers. And in some cases, kitchen mates, kitchens may also have a dipper well that's used for rinsing utensils. So over the next couple of slides, we're going to dive more deeply into each of these types of equipment, reviewing how they use water, options for reducing water use through simple operation and maintenance strategies. And then if you're considering an equipment upgrade, we're going to present options for retrofits or replacements. So first we'll start with food preservation and ice machines. Ice machine water use depends on several factors, and it's not just the amount of water that's produced. One such factor is the quality of the incoming water. So if your hotel has poor water quality, your ice machine is going to need to run more rinse cycles to achieve the required ice quality and clarity. In addition, and probably more importantly, water use is affected by how the ice making unit is cooled, whether that's through the use of water or air. So water cooled machines um, pass water once through the unit to remove the heat load and then it's discharged directly down the drain. An air-cooled air machine circulates air to remove the heat load. So for a frame of reference, a traditional water-cooled ice machine uses between 100 and 300 gallons for every 100 pounds of ice. Air-cooled models, on the other hand, use less than 50 gallons of water per 100 pounds of ice. So that's a substantial savings. However, it is important to note that not all air-cooled machines are equal. So um, switching to an air-cooling machine might save water but they also can be more energy intensive. So in this case, energy store qualified models are a good option because they use less water and energy than standard air-cooled models. There are some simple things you can do to ensure your current ice machine is operating as efficiently as possible, which will reduce its overall water and energy use. 
First, make sure to keep the machine clean, including the coils, to ensure the heat exchange process is running efficiently and that you aren't wasting more ice than is necessary. Be sure to keep the lid closed and then train any staff to identify and report leaks or malfun malfunctioning equipment and fix those immediately. You may also want to consider working with the manufacturer to ensure that your rinse cycles are set to the lowest frequency that's necessary to give you the ice quality you need. If you're considering retrofitting or replacing your ice machine to reduce water use, here are some key things you might want to consider. If your ice machine is water cooled, you can modify it to recirculate the cooling water through a cooling tower or a heat exchanger rather than just discharging it down the drain. Alternatively, you could consider collecting that cooling water for reuse in another application. If you're considering replacing your ice machine, first evaluate your ice making needs and choose a machine that's appropriately sized. Also look for Energy Star qualified models that use 15% less energy and 10% less water than standard air-cooled models. And finally, consider the type of ice you need. Typically, flake or nugget machines use less water and energy than cubed ice machines. Okay, now we're going to move on to food preparation equipment. Over the next couple of slides, we're going to discuss some equipment that uses water to generate steam for cooking. The first of such equipment is combination ovens, or combi ovens. Combi ovens combine three different modes of cooking into one unit. They use steam, circulated hot air, and then a combination of the two. The amount of water a combi oven requires is determined by the steam source. And this is true for all of the cooking equipment we're going to be discussing in the next few slides. Um, so there are two types of units. There are boiler-based and there are connectionless. Boiler-based units are connected to a central boiler that provides the steam and a constant supply. And in many cases, water is also used to cool the condensed steam to an appropriate temperature before it's disposed of down the drain. Connectionless units, on the other hand, have an individual reservoir and a heat source to generate the steam, so the steam is generated more on demand. And though the reservoir needs to be filled regularly, it doesn't require a dedicated drain for condensate or the addition of cooling water, saving a substantial amount of water. Just for reference, boiler-based combi ovens use 30 to 40 gallons of water per hour, while connectionless models can use less than half that amount. Uh, so first and foremost, and we're going to be mentioning this several times throughout the presentation, make sure your existing equipment is operating efficiently and effectively. For combi ovens, this means using the modes that use steam sparingly. These are very water and energy intensive to operate. Be sure to turn down the oven or turn it off when it's not in use. And then make sure the doors are closed and that they're aligned properly to provide a good seal so you keep the heat and the steam inside. And then try to load the oven to capacity to make, sure, to make the most use of the steam. At this time, WaterSense is not aware of any retrofit options for combi ovens. However, if you're in the market to replace your existing combination oven or you're purchasing a new one, you should look for Energy Star qualified models. Energy Star provides information on the water use of, of their qualified models, so be sure to look for ones that use no more than 15 gallons of water per hour or 3.5 gallons per pan hour. And as with all equipment, make sure that the size fits your cooking needs because oversized equipment can waste water and energy. Steam cookers, or otherwise known as food steamers, are another type of water using food preparation equipment. They are used to prepare foods through a sealed vessel that limits the escape of air and liquids below a preset pressure. Like combi ovens, there are two types. There are boiler based and connectionless units and the steam source would dictate how much um, water the equipment uses. Traditional boiler-based steam cookers use 40 gallons of water per hour, where energy, while Energy Star models use an average of 3 gallons of water, which is about 90% savings. To make sure your existing equipment is operating efficiently, um, here are some key things you can consider. Prepare your food and use the steam cooker in batches. So the less frequently you open and close the steam cooker, the more heat in the steam is going to be retained inside. Make sure to fill the unit to capacity and make use of the separate compartments, using only as many compartments as you need. 
and then make sure that the steamer returns to standby mode when it's not in use and turn it off at night or during other long periods when it's not being used. And lastly, look and repair look for and repair any leaks and for boiler based models, make sure to remove any buildup from the boiler so the steam supply remains efficient. Like combi ovens, WaterSense is currently unaware of any retrofit options for steam cookers, but if you're looking to replace or purchase a new one, um, you should consider Energy Star qualified models. These are connectionless units and they use 90% less water than the boiler base unit. In addition, evaluate and choose a steam cooker that's sized to match your cooking needs. Steam kettles are the last of the food preparation equipment we're going to be discussing today. They are essentially like a big soup or stock pot. The kettle is surrounded by a jacket that circulates steam to heat the kettle contents. And like the two previous equipment that we spoke about, there are two types. There are boiler-based and connectionless or self-contained units, both of which are depicted here on the slide. Because the steam is contained within the jacket, boiler-based units require regular blowdown to remove condensate on the steam supply line. This process can consume 100,000 gallons of water a year, so it's very water intensive. However, because the steam does not come into contact with the food, the blowdown water can be trapped and returned to the boiler for reuse, and that's different than the other two types of equipment. Self-contained units, on the other hand, have an internal heating element to generate the steam, but they do still require regular dumping and cleaning. For all steam kettles, be sure to turn them off or down between uses and ensure the lid is secure to reduce the amount of steam and energy required for cooking. And for self-contained units, be sure to monitor water levels and maintain temperature control components and dump the water daily to prevent mineral buildup and maintain the system's efficiency. Unlike combi ovens and steam cookers, there are retrofit options for boiler-based steam kettles that can save water and energy. You can install a condensate return system if one doesn't exist. This will direct the blowdown back to the central boiler for reuse. And in addition, if you're going to do that, be sure to insulate that condensate return line so that you'll see additional energy savings. If you're looking to replace or purchase a new steam kettle, make sure the kettle is sized appropriately for its use. Kettles can range from a half a gallon all the way up to 200 gallons. Energy Star doesn't qualify steam kettles at this time, but you can consider purchasing a self-contained unit, or if a boiler-based model is necessary, you can choose one that has a built-in condensate return system. Okay, now we're going to be moving on to the cleaning and washing equipment. Um, the first one is commercial pre rinse spray valves, and these are nozzles on the end of a hose that are used to remove food residue from dishes prior to putting them in the dishwasher. Standard pre rinse spray valves use 1.6 gallons per minute, some older models as much as 4.5 gallons per minute. WaterSense does label pre rinse spray valves, and these models are 20% more efficient than the standard models. For operation and maintenance, first and foremost, you need to make sure your dishwashers are using the spray valves only when necessary. So be sure to make sure they're scraping and scrapping food waste if possible and pre-soak any heavily soiled dishes to remove stuck on debris. If the spray valve has an always on clamp, which many of them do, make sure that the operators are only engaging those when the spray valve's in use and they're not leaving them on continuously. In addition, periodically inspect the nozzles for scale and buildup to make sure the flow is not being restricted so that the unit continues to perform. And then periodically inspect the spray valve for leak or for leaks or broken parts, particularly around the nose, nozzle, and the handle. Um, these things can get pretty beat up during use, um, and they're fairly easily damaged and can leak as a result. pre and spray valves are relatively inexpensive, and newer units can be substantially more efficient, so consider replacement instead of any kind of a retrofit. In those instances, look for WaterSense labeled models. They use 1.28 gallons per minute or less, some substantially less than that, and they're also certified for performance, so they're um, tested for their spray force and their life cycle. Food disposals can also be another intensive water use in a commercial kitchen. Many kitchens use food grinders, which require continuously running water to prevent damage to the grinder blades. 
Many kitchens also combine that with a sluice trough, which is what's pictured here, and water is continuously applied through a series of nozzles at a rate of 2 to 15 gallons per minute to rinse the food scraps into the disposal. Food pulpers or strainers, which we'll discuss in the next few slides, are water efficient alternatives to the traditional food grinder sleuth trough system. If you do have a traditional food disposal system, there are some operation and maintenance measures you can take to reduce their water use. First, turn off the water to the system during idle periods when the grinder isn't in use. Be sure to scrape larger food waste into the trash instead of putting it down the disposal. Use cold water instead of hot water. That will save energy and it will also help keep the grinder motor cool. And then avoid putting things like oils and grease and hard objects down the disposal, disposal which will damage the blades and make the grinder less efficient. And then along those lines, periodically inspect the system to make sure the blades remain sharp and there's no debris lodged. If you're looking to retrofit your existing garbage disposal system, there are devices that can adjust the water flow to the disposal based on the motor load. These devices can reduce the flow during the idle periods from the continuous 2 to 15 gallons a minute down to 1 gallon a minute. If you're looking to replace your existing food disposal system, look for models with that built-in load sensor or install a food grinder alternative such as a food pulper or a food strainer. Food pulpers, depicted in the diagram on this slide, crush food into a pulp, extract the excess water, and send the pulp waste to a bin for disposal or composting. The extracted water can then be recycled through the system, and as a result, they save about 75% of the water used for the food disposal process. Food strainers, another alternative, use little to no water. As the name implies, food scraps are rinsed and strained in the basket at the bottom of the sink for later disposal. Commercial dishwashers are one of the largest uses of water in the kitchen. There are several varieties depending on the facility's dishwashing needs, and they range from small undercounter models to large industrial flight type machines. Energy Star qualified commercial dishwashers can reduce water and energy use by 25% over standard models. As with all commercial kitchen equipment, your first priority should be reducing your water and energy use and make sure your existing equipment is operating efficiently and effectively. So that means only running the dishwashers when they're full and turning the machines off when they're not in use, particularly for the larger continuously running machines. Be sure to scrape dishes prior to loading and operate the dishwasher at the lowest flow rate and water pressure that's possible based on the manufacturer's recommendations. And then periodically inspect the nozzles and valves and repair any leaks you see immediately. There are retrofit options available for conveyor type machines, which are shown here. Um, consider installing a rack sensor that will allow the water to flow only when the dishes are present. If you're looking to install a new machine or replace an existing one, make sure the size and type of equipment matches your dishwashing needs. And look for Energy Star qualified undercounter and conveyor type models that are 25% more water and energy efficient. There are also models that can recycle or reuse rinse water from the latter phases of the dishwashing process. For the largest flight type machines, Energy Star doesn't currently qualify those, but you can look for models that use less than 0.01 gallons of water per dish. And last but not least, we're going to cover wash down sprayers. These are used for cleaning surfaces in kitchens. They can use large volumes of water to provide a high pressure cleaning stream, typically 7 gallons a minute, but some use as many as 20 gallons or more. There are several more efficient alternatives to wash down sprayers, including pressure washers, water broom, or the traditional sweeping and mopping. If using a wash down sprayer is necessary, keep these tips in mind. Only use them to clean surfaces. Do not use them to clean dishes. Pre-rinse spray valves are designed for dish cleaning and can use significantly less water. Make sure you also shut the water off to the sprayer when they're not in use. And if time and resources allow, consider alternatives such as mopping. 
If your wash down sprayer does not have a self-closing nozzle, particularly if it's a high-flowing model, consider installing one. These can reduce the flow rate to 7 gallons per minute and prevent water waste when the sprayer isn't in use. In addition, consider alternatives to your wash down sprayer altogether. A pressure washer is a good alternative and can be just as effective, but it only uses 3 gallons a minute or less. So we've covered a lot of ground on the last few slides. Um, so this slide is just a summary of the water efficient alternatives and the savings you might see for a variety of the water using equipment you would find in and around your kitchen. Um, okay, next slide. So to provide some perspective on the potential savings, here's just one example of the savings your hotel might see if you were to replace a standard pre-rinse spray valve with the WaterSense labeled model. These products can save you roughly 7,000 gallons of water and $115 in water and energy costs per year, and often that results in a simple payback on the product of less than a year. And that savings is also equivalent to provide some perspective for washing 5,000 racks of dishes or running a convection oven for 12 hours a day for three weeks. So it's pretty substantial. So estimating water savings and payback and even prioritizing projects might seem like a daunting task, but WaterSense at Work, which is EPA's Water Efficiency um, Best Management Practice Guide, can be a good resource. It identifies some simple assumptions you can use and will walk you through water use and savings calculations for the specific equipment you're evaluating. And once you have a good handle on the estimated savings, um, it can also help guide you through estimating the project cost effectiveness. And that's a good metric to help you prioritize projects that you may want to implement. Then to wrap it all in a nice, neat package, WaterSense at Work also provides useful information regarding project financing so that you can actually implement the projects you identify. In addition, we did review financing options during the Assess, Track, and Realize Payback webinar that we put on earlier this year as part of the training series. So if you weren't able to attend that webinar, you can consider viewing it on the Hotel Challenge Tools and Trainings page on the WaterSense website. Great. Um, as we mentioned earlier, WaterSense has also developed the Water Use Tool, um, and that's designed to help facility personnel conduct a water assessment and evaluate and prioritize projects. And the tool addresses all major water use areas of a hotel, including commercial kitchen water use. And this slide here is just a screenshot from the commercial kitchens tab. You can um, download the tool from the WaterSense website along with several water assessment worksheets, and that will walk you through a water assessment and help you gather all the information you need to populate the tool. You can also review the Demonstrating Water Sense's Water Use Tool webinar, which we put on earlier this year as part of the Hotel Challenge training series. Wow, that was a lot of information, Kim. Thank you so much for presenting on all of that kitchen equipment. At this time, we'd like to take another break for questions. So please type those questions into the chat box and we'll address them as they come in. But while we're waiting, I'm going to launch a quick poll for the audience. So we are wondering whether your hotel has addressed water efficiency through operation and maintenance or retrofits or replacements for any of the commercial kitchen equipment that we reviewed today. So just take a, a second to answer that poll for us, please.
All right, great. Thanks for taking that poll for us. So here are the results that we have gotten. So it looks like pre-rinse spray valves are the most common equipment that people have addressed the water efficiency of, and that's an easy replacement, so that's great. Um, and it looks like a lot of you are maybe doing some in the future, not at this time, though. So thanks for that information. Okay, so our first question uh, is wondering whether we have any checklists available for kitchen hotel kitchen managers. Um, to answer that question, yes. Uh, um, the water use tool and the water assessment worksheets are essentially a checklist that will walk you through um, the whole hotel, but there is a specific section related to commercial kitchens that you can use to identify all of the specific equipment that uses water in the kitchen and the information you would need to really be able to understand and assess how much water they're using and what options may be available to you for reducing that water use. Yeah, and the, the other thing I will say is that, uh, this is Taro here again, um, that a lot of times we um, you know, defer to the uh, standard operating procedures of the actual facility and we encourage the managers to take a look at those SOPs and see if they are, if there are any areas where the method of cleaning something or the process that they use could be made more water efficient because sometimes it's just as simple as telling someone that they should turn something off um, when doing something else. So, um, you know, there are many opportunities in, in just the basics as well. Great. Well, it looks like we don't have any other questions at this time, but if more come in, we'll address them later on in the webinar. So now let's hear from Ray Dennis on how Loyola Marymount University has put many of these best practices in action in their dining halls across the campus. Ray? Hello. Great. Um, welcome, everyone. This is Ray Dennis. And I am uh, with Loyola Marymount University. We're located in Los Angeles, California. And I focused in uh, higher education. Uh, just to tell you a little bit about our background, we are a Princeton Green Campus. Princeton uh, is the organization that ranks universities in terms of their green practices. And Loyola Marymount University is listed in the top 322. Uh, there's about 4,000 universities in the country. Uh, I do know that we're not a hotel per se, but we do have many similarities. Our demographics are consistent of 6,000 undergraduate students and 2,000 graduate students and approximately 2,000 employees. Uh, we are an undergraduate as well as a graduate program offering master's degree programs, credentials, as well as extended education. My role in auxiliary is I oversee Elmi Hospitality and Dining, and we are responsible for four commercial kitchens uh, and approximately 14 satellite venues. And those venues can be anything from a Starbucks to a Jamba Juice to a Jasmine's Cafe, a World of Wings, a diner, and so forth and so on. Uh, for the purposes of this presentation, I am going to focus on primarily the Lair Marketplace, which is our largest venue where we serve approximately 25,000 guests a week. So it does a lot of transactions. Uh, as a campus, all 18 satellite locations, we're doing about 45,000 uh, meal transactions a week. Uh, we have a secondary dining room called Roski Dining that does about 5,000, as well as the remainder of the campus that does anywhere from 10 to 15,000 weekly guests. We also run a major uh, camp program during the summer, as well as we reach out to uh, some of our uh, athletic programs as well. So as we go to the next slide, uh, you'll see that, that Loyola Marymount is interested in partnering with groups like the EPA and the Water Sense Program. Uh, as you know, the information on California, we're in our third year of a statewide drought, and we are experiencing water restrictions. We're in the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power, I'll refer to them as LADWP jurisdiction, and we also um, are participating with Southern California Metropolitan Water District who receives their water, um, or excuse me, who supports the water of the LADWP to support what happens in um, the distribution network of water. Uh, we are currently under voluntary restrictions in Los Angeles by the LADWP and we know that 
uh, for those of you who are in California and probably other similar environments, uh, rate increases will continue. We are expecting about an 8% increase per annum over the next five years. And in the University of Higher Education, where you have to be conscious of uh, reducing the cost of attendance and tuition increases, you have to look for ways to reduce your cost. So obviously there's the ROI that's already there built into saving water, and I hope that does extrapolate to the hotel industry as well. Uh, we also have students, students that come from all around the country, and they're environmentally conscious. And they have organizations. So we have focused on the triple bottom line, people, planet, and profits, in order to deal with um, ensuring that we have an environment that is safe for the future, as well as focus on reducing our bottom line uh, to the university in terms of our cost containment. Next slide. On the next slide, we'll see that we have in our strategic plan this verbiage here. And it's good to have a vision uh, as it around, that surrounds these uh, things. Strengthen the university's commitment to stewardship. And I think that's important as many of the millennials and Generation X and Generation Y have grew up in a environmentally conscious uh, mindset. Uh, we also want to be uh, ethically sustainable, do things that do not um, destroy the environment, as well as our environmental justice concern uh, for how we do business on campus, not only in food service, but throughout, uh, to ensure human resilience. We want to ensure from an institutional perspective that we are not um, adding to the carbon footprint and as I say, you know, saving water saves lives. For a hotel, just like a university, competitive advantage is important. Whether you're in the kitchen or whether you're in sales or marketing, your rankings and your marketplace delineation are being assessed by your customers, assessed by your students who are evaluating your university. This is not just greenwashing. We are certified by Green Restaurant Association who certifies uh, all of your practices, whether you're sourcing organically, locally, your water conservation, your energy conservation, your utensils, uh, all of your products, we are certified as a four-star location. The only other university in the country with that certification is uh, Boston University. Uh, all other schools that are Green Restaurant certified are three stars. So we're particularly proud of that. We also are an LADWP, Los Angeles Department of Water Power Green Partner, as well as a member of the United States Zero Waste Business Council. And for that group, we do consider water, if it's not used, wasted. So uh, in California, all of us are looking to reduce our uh, waste, whether it be water, whether it be food, whether it be organics. As we know, legislation is coming out of two. SBA, uh, Senate Bill number 341, tells us we have to reduce our waste by 75% by the year 2020. If we can advance to the next slide, we will also understand that LMU uses a good chunk of water. Uh, we have 142 acres of property here that the school resides on. So we have undertook uh, drought-tolerant landscaping. We are a purple pipe campus, which means that we use recycled water on 75% of our grounds all around our dining facilities outdoors. We also have identified that we do have restrooms, many restrooms, dish rooms, our three compartment sinks, hand wash sinks. Um, food preparation is an important part where we know water is used at fountain machines, cleaning and sanitation. Now, obviously, there are other uses on campus, but for the purpose of this presentation, I'm going to focus on these right here. Uh, if we can go to the next slide, we will see that uh, the university has some extended hours, just like hotels. We're open, however, 2027 20, academic days of the year. Hotels are typically open 360 days or 365 days of the year. Uh, we do use a contract provider, it's Sodexo, and we offer uh, an all you care to eat program. And you think that an all you care to eat program is one of those that's highly intensive on water as well as food waste. But we uh, service our full dining staff, uh, including uh, providing catering like hotels do and some of the banquet halls. Our students, our guests, our camps, our conferences, visitors, and so forth and so on. Uh, we have taken some initiatives that are consistent with what we're trying to achieve. So therefore, we only procure Energy Star equipment. And it's great to hear uh, that being resonated by the WaterSense and the EPA. Uh, and there are a number of models that we use, but we only uh, purchase Energy Star equipment whenever we can. Uh, some of the efficiencies that we've already implemented is metering and sub-metering. 
Uh, many places have a central meter that comes into the campus. We have installed submeters in our kitchen, analog meters on our water, and we are tracking how much water our three compartment sink is using. We're tracking how much water our pulper is recycling uh, from our dishwasher. Uh, we've implemented through our uh, provider that we don't thaw food by just running water over it. Uh, we also have focused on removing the final and last remainder a couple years ago of garbage disposals. And if you're in the LA County area, garbage disposals are not allowed in commercial kitchens according to the City of LA Bureau of Sanitation. We also have uh, baskets, salvage door capture baskets to capture uh, not only food but also just recycle water uh, into our SOMAT pulp or dehydrator. And I saw that on the presentation earlier as well. Uh, we've installed in the Lair Marketplace, Green Restaurant approved, uh, uh, low flow water sprayers. And again, you know, that's a training process you have to attend to because many of your employees want to take it off and put a more powerful hold on there. And, you know, we spank their hand when they do that kind of stuff. And so we finally changed the culture and behavior there. We've also installed uh, faucet aerators, not only our, on our hand wash sinks, but where practical, we have installed them on some of our wash sinks. Uh, our flight type dishwashing machine, uh, we replaced it. It used, consumed 352 gallons of water in the rinse cycle versus our newer machine, which we installed two years ago. It used only 98 gallons, as well as used 25% um, electricity to operate. We've added a fog tank. Uh, fog tanks are really great um, because it takes some of the pressure off your three compartment sink and that fog tank decarbonizes your uh, pans, pots, and things like that so that not only do you cook faster, you also do not have to wash them through the flight machine as frequently. You only have to spray them. All ice machines were replaced. We all have uh, ice machines that our brand that we particularly use is Hoshizaki, which is 2014 Energy Star uh, winner. Uh, according to uh, the food service industry. And we also use low flow sensor to toilets and faucets throughout our restrooms that the employees have within the dining facility. Uh, we'll advance to the next slide, please. So the results, and we'll be done. The results are we curtailed, curtailed our hydrojetting. Uh, we have an uh, organic enzyme system that releases an, an, en or an enzyme every 15 minutes into our drain lines in our kitchen. And what that does, it prevented us from having to hydrojet. We do not have to hydrojet at all in the year 2013. Uh, it also reduces the FOGs, food, oil, and gas, that are going into your grease trap, thus reducing the number of times you have to have your contractor come in to pump your grease from your um, cooking. Uh, we've installed jet sprays, and the jet sprays have saved us approximately about a million gallons per year. Uh, our aerators have saved approximately 2 million gallons per year, and our dishwasher has saved uh, anywhere from 578,000 gallons of water to as much as 760,000 gallons of water. The fog tank uh, is, is currently underway. We estimate by the end of the year it will save us probably 743,000 gallons of water, as well as our sensor faucets will save us 281,000 gallons of water. The sensor toilets, we don't have very many. We do have also low flow shower heads for the employees that uh, come into work and change their uniforms in their locker and they might uh, take a shower and they leave. We have about 234 employees in our cooking and dining facility on campus. So to get a perspective of these changes, our sensor toilets went from 1.6 to 1.28 gallons per minute. Our sensor faucets went from 1.6 to 0.5 per minute. Our uh, fog tank is a 40-gallon fog tank, and that 40 gallons of water lasts us for 30 days before you have to change it. Uh, we also campus-wide uh, on our aerators. Uh, we installed about 100 aerators throughout the campus in our 18 locations. Uh, those aerators uh, went from a 2.2 gallon per minute flow to about a 1.0 gallon per minute flow. Uh, our free rent sprayers, seven hours a day. Uh, we estimate, you know, we went from a 1.28 to a 0.65, and the spray is a really important because it does mean that even though we're union employees, employees have to work just a little bit harder to scrape all of the food off, as was mentioned earlier. So uh, we're not done yet because we do know there's always room for improvement. We are paying approximately five dollars and eighty-five cents per hundred cubic feet of water. One hundred cubic feet of water is seven hundred forty-eight gallons. 
We also have to pay, according to LAEWP, sewer service connection charges, and your sewer service connection charges are linked to how much water you use. That rate is approximately about 373 to 397 um, per gallon, per uh, ACF. So um, it, it really does add up. You know, as a campus, we're probably spending about $5 million a year on utility costs. And our goal is to uh, not only be practical in the sense of the environment, but respond to the needs of our customers, the sense that we are being good stewards, as well as uh, focus on that triple bottom line. I think that's the last of my slides. Uh, I am open for questions, if there are any questions. Wow, thanks for that really great presentation, Ray. Really good comprehensive overview of all that you're doing at Loyola Marymount. Um, so we have a few questions that have already come in for Ray, but keep them coming. First, um, Carly would like to know how long it took for you to get your staff to really buy into these water efficiency activities. And you could also maybe explain how you got them to buy into it, too. Okay. Um, well, it, it took a little while. I, I'll, I'll be very honest with you. Um, but because we are uh, managed by a contract provider and, and many of our employees uh, have a culture where they're used to just throwing things away or water running, it, it took some while. It took some HR work. It, it, it did take some uh, constant retraining. And the companies that work with us to install a lot of these things came back out to do the training. So, for example, you know, when you look at why not just throw the trash out of the compactor versus, okay, let's uh, pulp it and then let's uh, now put it in a dehydrator and then let's put it in a bin so it can go into animal feed. Um, those are not standard practices that you'll find in our regular residential homes. It took a little while, but once employees were incentivized uh, by the contract provider to do a good job and they uh, saw that it was saving them some time and some effort and some work, they typically bought in. So I would, I would think once you start this, you're probably looking at about six months lead time. We've been at this for probably about two, maybe two and a half years. That's some helpful information and background. Did you, um, this is Tara Ray, did you include that in the performance, um, those types of performance measures when you were making the contract with the providers, or is that something that you kind of worked with them afterwards to include? We, we work with them afterwards, and, and we're right now um, finishing off on an RFP, whereby uh, the future provider and the three major players, uh, they have to all meet these standards going forward. We can't go backwards. Our, our students expect it, and too much is at stake for the environment. That's, that's great. So do you um, have signage in your dining hall to educate the students as well, or are you working with the student groups to Absolutely. get the word out? Absolutely. We're in partnership with the uh, student leadership. They have a sustainability vice president in student government. And in our layer marketplace, we have a signage. We have no trash cans in there. We have signage to show how uh, we take pre- and post-consumer waste, run it through the system, through our dishes. We're on China. We're on silverware. Uh, we do allow compostables to be used if someone is taking something to go. But everything ends up going through this process. And so the students have embraced it uh, tremendously. And even our suppliers, Coca-Cola, we've asked them to provide us only with eco-tainer cups which are more expensive, but they're biodegradable and made out of recycled material. So um, I think that um, in a university, the, the students have been trained from K through 12 uh, about being environmentally conscious. And when they get to a higher education, they expect it. That's great. That's a, that's a really great example of how you can you know, get the behavior change from the actual users to not just your employees. I think that's a, an awesome example. Thank you very much for sharing. Sure. And we have another question, just looking for a little bit more information on the upgrades that you did to your fog tank. Fog tank, okay. So as you know, a three compartment sink, if you got a 30 inch three compartment sink, you got to wash, your rinse, and sanitize. Each one uses probably about, I would say somewhere around about 30 gallons. So you're using about, using about 100 gallons uh, to fill that puppy up. And it only lasts so long, so you got to flush it and then refill it and then you got to flush it and refill it whether it's breakfast, lunch, or dinner. Um, you have to be audited by the health department so forth and so on. So what we did was there's a company and there's several others. There's, uh, we used one called Hygienics 
uh, fog tank, and uh, we got a good price on it. Brought it in last semester. We've got a meter now, an analog meter, on our three compartment sink to measure how much water it is using. So what we have done, the, the fog tank is uh, 40 gallons of water. You have a mix uh, solution that you pour into that water. Uh, it runs off regular 110, and what it does, it takes all the carbon off of your uh, bakery pans, your pots, and things like that. Then what happens at that point is that you only have to just rinse it. You don't, you don't have to do anything else. You just basically rinse it. Uh, so in essence, you're saving yourself from having to run it through your dish machine. Um, so 40 gallons of water, if you can reduce your three compartment sink down to two refills, you immediately save 100 gallons in one day versus using 40 gallons of water for 30 days. Hope that kind of clarifies it. I think that does. Okay. So it looks like for now that's our last question. Thank you again, Ray, for all of that great information. And You're welcome. So let's take a few minutes just to review what we've learned in the webinar now. Tara? Thanks, Laura, and thank you, Ray, for that really great case study. We appreciate you taking the time to share your successes with the group. It's a really great example of how all of these pieces can fit together and save significant amounts of water and energy in the process. So, You're welcome. Yep. Yeah, excellent. So as we discussed earlier, water use in commercial kitchens accounts for about 14% of hotels' water use. And as a first step, um, you can implement water efficient operation and maintenance practices to make sure that your food service equipment is operating efficiently and effectively. Some of these measures are relatively easy to implement, require little capital cost, and can result in significant water and energy savings. In addition, considering equipment retrofits or replacements where appropriate can also get additional water and energy savings. Look for the WaterSense label on pre rinse spray valves or energy qualified, energy star qualified ice machines, steam cookers, combi ovens, and dishwashers. These models provide significant water and energy savings over standard models and are certified for efficiency and performance. Lastly, you can consult the WaterSense at Work uh, Best Management Practices Guide for additional replacement or retrofit options or other ideas for equipment such as steam kettles, food disposals, wash down sprayers, and to help you calculate project savings and cost effectiveness. So after all of this information, I'm sure many of you are sitting there thinking, what can you do right now? And some of the things obviously take a lot longer and require some training and some, um, some effort, but there are some simple things that you can do today um, if you want to start saving. So uh, one of them is to first ensure that you are properly operating and maintaining your existing equipment. I know we said this a bunch of times on the call, but it is one of the biggest and most important um, aspects because it is a lot of the uh, savings can come during the use phase. Um, also, you can train your staff to scrape their dishes and to soak the uh, food off the dishes basically before you are putting them in a dishwasher or rinsing them with the pre-rinse spray valve. You can also uh, load your cooking equipment and dishwashers to full capacity. And you can also replace your, an existing pre rinse spray valve with a WaterSense labeled model. And this can actually provide you payback in less than a year. Then you can also download and use the water use tool, which is available on our website, to assess and prioritize other water savings opportunities in your kitchen and throughout your hotel or other type of facility. So we hope that you found the content of today's webinar useful. Um, we have actually done a series about seven of these webinars so far, and the recordings are available up on the WaterSense Tools and Trainings page under the Hotel Challenge. And each one of the webinars, um, like this one today, covers a different aspect of water management, um, including water management planning and water assessments, and best management practices for sanitary fixtures, uh, laundry equipment, outdoor water use, mechanical systems, education and outreach, including employee education, and um, demonstrating our water use tools. So if you missed those webinars, we encourage you to 
take a look on our website. We have a YouTube channel that has recordings of all of the webinars, like the ones we have today. We also have a bunch of our case studies from the different webinars written up and posted on the website as well for you to take a look at. And we'll be uh, putting together one for this webinar um, and for Loyola Marymount as well. And then we are also going to be repeating our intro to the challenge call called Taking the Plunge on September 18th. Um, now that we have more of our tools and resources available, we thought it would be a good idea to uh, tell people about it again. And so we're also scheduling additional webinars for the next coming month. So keep an eye out. Um, all webinar registration details will be available on our website, and they'll also be in our monthly tip 